The relatives of those killed mourn their dead. The brother of one of the victims was caught up in the attack. We heard heavy gunfire. We ran for cover behind the house. A group of about eight armed fighters told us to lie on the ground. They said if we refused, they will kill us all. The city of Beni is in North Kivu province. Dozens of armed groups operate in the area, including the Allied Democratic Forces, which is believed to be behind this latest attack. Originally a Ugandan rebel group, they've been rooted in the DRC's Virunga National Park for 20 years. They retreated there after a failed bid to turn Uganda into an Islamic state. The ADF has a brutal reputation. It's blamed for hundreds of civilian deaths in Beni over the last three years, as well as mass rape and recruiting child soldiers. People living there say President Joseph Kabila's government has abandoned them. We are tired of this. If the government has already sold this country, then they should compensate us and we leave. How can it be possible for civilians to be killed in the city of Beni, where you have the Congolese army and a United Nations base here? People in Beni are also struggling to deal with an outbreak of the Ebola virus. But where conflict is complicating the response, science is helping it. Dozens of people are being treated with experimental new drugs for the first time. But people also want protection from the ADF rebels and say they've had enough of the government's broken promises. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera. Hospitals in central Sulawesi are struggling to cope following the earthquake and tsunami. Many patients have to wait in stiflingly hot tents with limited medical equipment to treat them. Most of the doctors and nurses are gone. This is one of the largest hospitals in Palu and is operating with around 10% of its original staff. We're trying to call the staff to get them to come back. Then we'll be able to identify who's still here, who left and who we lost to the disaster. The damage shows what the medical workers had to deal with on the night of the disaster. It's thought there are around 30 people still unaccounted for inside this building, including hospital staff and patients. There are so many bodies still buried in mud and beneath rubble around the disaster areas that it's increasingly becoming a health concern, particularly for the search teams. Handling the decomposing bodies and body parts exposes the recovery workers to diseases such as tuberculosis and cholera. The disaster has also left more than 60,000 homeless. Many are living in the open where rubbish is not being collected and there are no toilets. Doctors say they are starting to see an increase in diarrhea and skin rashes. The primary health clinic is, is, uh, is not working optimally right now, so it is still supported by the volunteers. However, the volunteers is limited here, so it's kind of uh, we have to educate people to, to go to uh, the, the clinic or any uh, medical team that provide uh, the, the health care. There's a constant risk of survivors suffering injuries, so free tetanus shots are being given. Many people spend their days making dangerous treks across the rubble and debris to where they used to live. More than a week on, the scale of this disaster is still emerging and the number of casualties continues to grow. The many potential health risks could make the crisis even worse. Wayne Hay, Al Jazeera, Palu, Indonesia. A toxic algae that's harmful to humans is spreading from Florida's Gulf Coast to Atlantic beaches for the first time in more than a decade. The phenomenon, known as red tide, can kill fish and cause respiratory issues in people. State officials say the Gulf Coast bloom now stretches along 135 miles of Florida coastline. Manuel Bajorcas is in North Miami Beach, where another bloom is washing ashore. Manuel, good morning. Good morning. This is Hallover Beach, and you can see it is empty right now, though it's typically one of the more popular spots here in South Florida. It was shut down yesterday as officials were trying to keep people away from the water as they wait for this slow moving menace to pass. We don't want anybody out here today and uh, it'd be exposed to these toxins. Miles of pristine beach along Florida's Atlantic coast were deserted, shut down after officials confirmed a toxic red tide bloom just offshore. I think Mother Nature is getting angry and doing crazy stuff. I can't even really get close to it without my throat tickles so bad that I'm constantly. <laughs> 
Red tides are caused by a naturally occurring toxic algae that is normally seen on the Gulf Coast. Its spread to the Atlantic coast is believed to be partially caused by agricultural development around Florida's wetlands, leaving stagnant pockets of nutrient-rich water that can then feed the microscopic menace. Dr. Malcolm McFarland is with Florida Atlantic University. Does pollution make the bloom even worse? So nutrient pollution, things like agricultural runoff and fertilizer runoff from people's lawns, discharge from septic systems and wastewater treatment plants, those are all things that can act, exacerbate the problem. The problem has plagued coastal communities. Toxic blooms devastated Florida's fragile aquatic ecosystems, turning thriving waterways into death traps for entire schools of fish and other animals like sea turtles, manatees and dolphins. Humans and their pets can become seriously ill from breathing the poisonous fumes released when the blooms find their way onto the beach. You feel like you can't breathe. You, you got something in your throat. The East Coast bloom is already impacting businesses. Matt Greenberg's restaurant sat empty as soon as red tide came ashore. The last time I feel like it was this empty was like during the hurricane when we came and the whole island was shut down, so very weird. Biochemist Bill Lauda is an authority on how chemicals can impact an area's water supply. He recommends steering clear of the beach until the red tide runs its course. As waters get cooler, hopefully these things will start to go away. Just wait and see. You know, one of the big questions is how long is this going to take? The fumes can be so bad out here that you might be able to make out in that shot that our crew is having to wear masks out here. It is the ninth time since 1957 that red tide has been detected here along the east coast of Florida. The governor says the state will already allocate $3 million in grants to help affected counties. We should point out that Miami and Palm Beach County beaches are expected to reopen today, even though red tide still threatens parts of the coastline. Oh, Manuel, put on your mask, too. I'm yes. glad that the crew is wearing that mask. I'm fascinated by this story and what's happening because yeah. it certainly had heard about it on the Gulf, and now that Miami is affected as well, I hope they can find a solution to it. Figure it out. Mm -hmm. I hope so, too. Visiting Russian President Vladimir Putin has met with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi for the 19th India-Russia Annual Bilateral Summit in New Delhi on Friday. Addressing a joint press conference, Modi said the two countries have been cooperating closely in all international issues of mutual interest and highlighted the importance of bilateral ties. India gives top priority to its relations with Russia. In this rapidly changing world, our relations have become more relevant. Our special and privileged strategic partnership has consistently received new energy and direction from the continuous series of 19 summits. The two countries signed an agreement on building new nuclear power plants for India. We discussed in detail the flagship project and the peaceful use of nuclear energy. According to the agreements that we have, based on Russian high-tech technologies, we plan to build 12 power units in the next 20 years in India. India also signed a deal for the purchase of the S-400 air defense systems from Russia and other agreements in the areas of space, railways, trade, economic cooperation and transport. The signing of defense deal between the two countries has come amid the U.S. warning. The U.S. could impose sanctions using the Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act legislation. Analysts say the deal will help further cement Indo-Russian ties. The triumph has been one of the most significant deals, partly because uh, there has been a sense in Russia that Indo-Russian relations are sort of drifting. So I think by signing this deal, despite American pressure, India is signaling that it values Russia as a defense partner. And hopefully that will change the narrative in Russia about India and in India about Russia. Annual Russia-India trade has slipped below $10 billion and efforts to boost that figure are being worked out by both countries. India and Russia have a long history of friendship and strong military ties. Analysts say this visit by Russian President Vladimir Putin will go a long way towards further enhancing that relationship. Sanjay Sethi, Press TV. New unveiled Denver. its new strategy, which it says will finally win the 17-year-old war on terror. RT's correspondent Dan Cohen takes a look. National Security Advisor John Bolton announced what he called the America First National Strategy for Counterterrorism on Thursday. It focuses on the Islamic Republic of Iran, ISIS, and Al Qaeda. The proliferation of ISIS and Al Qaeda networks and their propaganda requires a new approach to address the threat to the United States from radical Islamist terrorists. 
In addition, the United States faces terrorist threats from Iran, which remains the most prominent state sponsor of terrorism, uh, really the world's central banker of international terrorism since 1979. The strategy calls ISIS the foremost radical Islamist terror group and notes that al-Qaeda leaders are working to consolidate and expand the group's presence in several regions, including in Syria. That's likely a reference to Idlib province in northern Syria, what U.S. envoy to the anti-ISIS coalition Brett McGurk called the largest al-Qaeda safe haven since 9-11. Will a Syrian and Russian military operation to liberate Idlib from its al-Qaeda rulers is on hold thanks to an agreement between Russia and Turkey. President Trump credited himself for preventing the operation after reading a report in the New York Times. It said that they were being surrounded and they were going in and starting literally the next day they were going to drop bombs all over the place and perhaps kill millions of people in order to get 35,000 terrorists. And I put out on social media and elsewhere, I gave Mike Pompeo, John Bolton, everybody these orders. Don't let it happen. Contradictions aside, Bolton warned this isn't the Obama administration. And while there aren't many differences between their respective counterterrorism strategies, one is in their approaches to the detention camp at Guantanamo Bay. President Obama promised to close Guantanamo, though ultimately he did not. And the Trump strategy calls to, quote, preserve our ability to detain terrorists and explore ways to better integrate and maximize the utility of this capability. Whether the Trump administration can deliver on its pledge to defeat terrorism while preventing other countries from doing so remains to be seen. In Washington, Dan Cohen, RT. For more, we go to former Pentagon official Michael Mullet. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Bolton stressed that the new anti-terrorism strategy will be different from the Obama administration's. What does that mean? Well, I think it means that uh, there'll be uh, uh, more intolerance of Iran than the Obama administration showed. Clearly, what this is is just a veiled uh, effort to uh, go after Iran. Uh, you'll notice that what was absent uh, was pretty much uh, any mention of uh, jihadi Salafists supported by um, uh, Saudi Arabia and the, and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, but you heard a lot about uh, Hamas and Hezbollah supported by Iran. Uh, the problem with that is that his, his, his goal is to lump everybody into one basket. The Hezbollah and Hamas are known as resistance groups. They're totally different than Taliban, Al-Qaeda. And, and ISIS, which chop off heads, blow up civilians anywhere. You're not, you don't see that. You, it wasn't Shia, which are Hezbollah, that has been catering to uh, going around the world, setting up caliphates and, and uh, launching attacks. But they're still supported by Saudi Arabia and UAE today, the, uh, namely the uh, jihadi Salafists. Well, we have not seen any major terrorist attacks in the United States under the Trump administration. Uh, hopefully that will continue on. However, under what uh, scenario do you think the U.S. will go to, would consider going to a full-scale war in Iran? I, if, I think if Israel goads them into it, um, I think that uh, constant, not, nothing on, that has to do with Iran policy today uh, is, is done without looking through the prism of Israel. And, uh, and what's strange is that Israel, even after the revolution, used to trade with uh, uh, Iran, namely in arms, because at that time the perceived enemy was Iraq. Today it's just totally different. And, and so now they, they are the perceived enemy. And you have Bolton, who in, back in 2003, when I briefed him once, basically said we're going to go in and take out uh, Baghdad, which was just before the invasion, then Damascus, then Tehran, Libya, Saudi Arabia, which all of those countries at that time were perceived to be the enemies of Israel. This is just a decision made um, uh, that's been delayed, if you will, uh, to, to now from 2003. Trump is not, even though Trump has said he was, is willing to speak with the Iranian leadership, the reality is that he is not in charge of his own foreign policy.
and that's what is emerging from this. What well, do you think is as much as the fact that Israel has the presidency, or this is being guided as much by Israel as much as Saudi Arabia? Remember, this was that it was his first trip was to Saudi Arabia. There's obviously some built-up partnerships that are going yeah, on behind the alliance. scenes. Yeah. So, do you think it's who has a bigger influence right now, President Trump, the Saudis or the Israelis? Well, they're both speaking uh, the uh, same language from, from, from the same language, from the same sheet of music at this point. Yeah, they're both listening. Uh, U.S. is supporting Saudi Arabia for its reasons, namely buying all of that military equipment and bringing in jobs. Israel, because of uh, his brother-in-law, because he uh, has moved the embassy and all of that. So, you know, you got to consider now, Israel, in effect, is also becoming a terrorist state itself. It has threatened, basically, uh, in recent days, Lebanon. And, and the civilians who live in an area purporting to say that there is underground uh, missile uh, manufacturing facilities. It has scared, it scared the uh, Lebanese people like crazy because of that, and now they fear an attack. I mean, is that any different than what uh, another uh, state sponsor is doing? I mean, this is, this is getting out of hand. Absolutely. As we continue to get more and more, I see it to think back to Iraq. I seem to think back to Libya. How, what, how can we, are we witnessing the same sort of steps going forward here? Yes, this is a build up to a crescendo. Of and what we've already done. History it, could what, what, repeat itself. With Iraq. And what we're seeing, what we're seeing here is that uh, we have I Israel against Iran, and what Israel would prefer is that U.S. military go in. So, so would uh, uh, Crown Prince Mo uh, Mohammed bin Salman. He would prefer to have the U.S. attack uh, 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 Iran. He can't do it. He can't even. He can't even uh, defeat. Uh, Yemen, which is next door, so they're, both of those countries are relying on U.S. military, and even the Pentagon at this point is hesitant. They're 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 holding back on this. I mean, they're not all full full bore for this. Let's go get Iran. Let's let's uh, let's change the regime militarily. They're not into that. Well, change isn't always good. And thanks for continuing to clarify the situation. For we try. Us. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey YouTube, thanks for checking out our channel. We hope you enjoyed the video. We have tons of content for you just like this. For more of RT America's one-of-a-kind news and analysis, be sure to subscribe and never stop questioning more. In a pre-dawn attack, six mid-range Iranian missiles cleared Iraqi airspace to hit a target in eastern Syria, nearly 600 kilometers away. Seven unmanned drones then dropped bombs on the same target. Iran's Revolutionary Guard said it was retaliation against those responsible for last week's attack at a military parade in Ahvaz in western Iran. Gunmen killed at least 25 people, many of them members of the Guard. The response was a show of such military force, it suggested there was a clear target. But Iran's leaders remain vague about the exact identity of the Ahvaz attackers. <laughs> If there was supposed to be a public message, the IRGC would have said so in their statement. But as it is anywhere in the world, any measures taken by a military or politician carry some messages. Maybe the obvious message is of Iran's decisive will to conduct a permanent and serious fight against centers that produce, train and equip terrorism at different levels. What the IRGC forces did early this morning was this will. In one statement attributed to Iran's Revolutionary Guard, the target is said to have been an ISIL base, which it says has U.S. backing. State TV showed a message painted on one of the missiles, death to America, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. There is little doubt who leaders in Tehran really blame. But whether there is some covert American action against Iran or not, the missile strike was as much about political theater as it was about a military response. The security of the Iranian nation is our red line and we won't compromise on this issue. We took tough revenge against American and Arab-backed terrorist groups. They used bullets, we responded with missiles. And leaders in Tehran say it's only the beginning. It could have gone differently. Iran could have conducted a ground campaign in tandem with Syrian allies. But flying its own missiles through Iraqi airspace to hit a target inside Syria by itself is about sending a message to everyone with a military presence there. Think twice before threatening Iran. Zain Basravi, Al Jazeera, Tehran. Has threatened Russia with a military strike after claiming that Moscow is developing banned cruise missiles. 
U.S. ambassador to NATO uh, K. Bailey Hutchison said that Russia is building medium-range ballistic missiles and in the, that's in violation of Intermediate-Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. She said Washington remains committed to a diplomatic solution, but it is ready to consider a military strike if Moscow does not halt its activity. Russian Foreign Ministry slammed the U.S. envoy's remarks as aggressive and destructive. It added that Washington will get a detailed response from Moscow's military experts. The U.S. claims Russia is developing a ground launch system in breach of a Cold War treaty that allows Russia to launch a nuclear strike on Europe, but Moscow has strongly denied the allegation. Joining us now out of Madison, Wisconsin, is James H. Fetzer, Professor Emeritus out of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Hello, Professor. It's a pleasure to have you back on the program, sir. Uh, your thoughts on Washington's, you know, threatening antics towards Moscow? The states confront several problems here. They're objecting to what they take to be uh, intermediate range missiles that are supposed to be banned by this treaty. But the United States isn't honoring treaties. It pulled out of the Iranian nuclear deal. So that's uh, one problem. A second problem is that they actually seem to be concerned about the fact that the Russians are developing a missile for which the United States has no defense. In particular, they have an intercontinental range nuclear powered cruise missile capable of penetrating any interceptor based missile defense system. Capabilities seem to be that of a supersonic missile with unlimited range and ability to dodge missile defenses. This is the real problem for the United States. The Russians have superior military equipment with which the United States cannot deal. The problem, I think, in the case of this particular hysterical reaction by the NATO spokesperson for the United States is that it was she was clearly talking about a preemptive strike on Russia. And of course, under the uh, United Nations Charter, there are only two conditions under which a preemptive strike is permissible, namely when a nation confronts an imminent threat or when it's actually uh, you know, uh, subject to, to an attack, which neither of which is obtaining here. So there's an awkward situation. She overstepped, she tried to wind it back. And uh, I think it's been a bit of a political fiasco for the United States. And you mentioned the Iran nuclear deal, but aside from that, I mean, if we're talking about missiles and just nuclear stuff, the U.S. has not abided by a lot of nuclear treaties itself. It's helped, you know, I don't want to talk about it, an apartheid regime in the Middle East, you know, build up a nuclear arsenal of 200 plus, you know, unreported, undocumented, a covert nuclear stockpile on Palestinian, uh, you know, occupied territory. It, it, and even itself, you know, ex-president, former president, you know, Barack Obama, he got a Nobel Peace Prize for disarmament. And then now we have the new regime and the administration of Donald Trump ready to revamp the entire U.S. nuclear arsenal. And here we are threatening Russia. One of the most interesting aspects of this article uh, is uh, from Russian sources, of course, uh, RT is that it reports in a tweet about here the United States is out whipping up hysteria without checking on the 200 to 400 nuclear missiles in the Israeli stockpile. The whole world knows this means the United States hypocrisy is on display here for everyone to see. It's a bit of a joke. I'm sorry to say Barack Obama most certainly did not deserve the Nobel Peace Prize. And there's no reason to believe that Donald Trump might receive one, though he's hoping, I think, on the outside that his work with North Korea might come to fruition, but it looks to me like it's really the North and the South Korea negotiating between themselves, letting the United States have played a role in initiating this, but carrying it on themselves. That might be deserving of uh, recognition, more so certainly than any act perpetrated by his predecessor, Barack Obama. But I think that this case is uh, really quite striking because the United States, frankly, doesn't have the military capability to deal with the superb modern weapons that are possessed by Russia, anti-ship missiles, anti-aircraft missiles, these new uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. The United States just doesn't have the defenses to deal with them, and I think this is what's led to this frustration and the hysteria from a spokesman for the United States.
Thank you once again for joining us on the program, Professor Fetzer, uh, so James H. Fetzer, everyone out of Madison, Wisconsin, Professor Emeritus out of the University of Minnesota. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Is that your reaction to what people who want you off the spotty shortlist? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And what about you being stripped of your belt? I mean, that, that, that's, uh, you must be very unhappy with that. What's your reaction to that? Jesus loves me and he loves you too and he loves you too. He loves these people in here and he loves everybody in the world. You All you've got to do is repent of your sins and you will be, be forgiven. And do you think you can win spotty? Do you want to win spotty? John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall have eternal life and shall not perish. Okay, Tyson. Uh, any, final, any final message to those people who, who have criticised you in recent? There's been a lot of criticism from people in signing petitions to the Scottish national people, to all sorts of yes, people. Yes, yes. Just, give us, just give us your take on it. Do you stand by your comments? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Okay, Tyson. The only way is through Jesus into heaven. That's all I can say. The A to Z, the Alpha, the Omega. Thanks. Jesus is the way, the key, and the only way into heaven. Okay, Tyson, thank Peace you out. so much. Thanks for stopping. Thank you.